Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 29th, 2011, and my guest is David Brady, the Davies Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Professor of Political Science and Leadership Values in the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and just a mere Professor of Political Science here at Stanford. <laughs> Dave, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. It's July 29th. Uh, we're taping this maybe four days before the debt ceiling is supposed to be uh, reached, and we're not sure what's going to happen. We're living in fascinating political times. What I want to do in this podcast is to take a broad look at the last three years of presidential and congressional politics, talk about where the electorate is now, and uh, then maybe hear your speculations about where we might be headed. Uh, a year ago, we spoke, August of 2010. It was about three months before the midterm elections. You said that a typical Democratic president in Midterm elections loses about 30 seats. You then talked about why that could be misleading. And yet, formal models of midterm elections by academic political scientists did predict in roughly that range. They all systematically underestimated what turned out to be the outcome, which I think was a loss 63 of seats. 63 seats for the Democrats. Uh, what happened and why did those models fail? The those models failed... Uh because uh, they essentially build into them that uh, co congressmen and congresswomen acted rationally. That is, that the members voted in line with what their constituents wanted. And, and they, with the idea that they wanted to be reelected, so right. they thought that would be the highest chance of... Exactly. So Good working assumption. It is a good working assumption, but what had happened uh, from 2008, if you recall, the expectations for President Obama were so high... It was as though uh, everyone believed that the Israelis and the Palestinians would suddenly hold hands, sing kumbaya, and all would be well. And, the economy uh, was going to get fixed. Exactly. By the experts. And what happened was essentially that about six, seven months into Obama presidency, as they began to focus on the health care issue and to a lesser extent on, on the environment, uh, the president, the public began to perceive the president as a more liberal than moderate, and b more partisan than nonpartisan. That built up over time. Now the Republicans, within three four weeks, uh, the best he ever did among Republicans was about even Stephen, but within a month, uh, he even was, Stephen meaning half about Republican. forty percent said that they were uh, thought he was doing an okay job, and forty percent thought he wasn't. <clears throat> but within within a month or so, they'd gone back to traditional numbers opposing. Honeyman and, was over. Yeah, and the Democrats uh, continued to like him. Uh, but uh, the rise of independence in the United States, the plurality of people now when asked, you consider yourself Democrat, Republican, or say they're independent, uh, they were the ones that began swinging away from Obama, and they began swinging away because, of, uh, be because they thought he was more par liberal and more partisan, <clears throat> not what they thought they'd elected. Um, so he was by supposed the, to be postpartisan. Yes, by the time you get to the uh, 2010 election, pushing the health care, pushing the cap and trade, uh, the the result was that uh, the independents had swung strongly uh, to that. So, so the point was that uh, in uh, there were 40 some districts that had uh, elected a Democratic congressman or congresswoman but who had uh, also voted for uh, Senator McCain over Obama. Well, those they were the, vulnerable. Yeah, they were vulnerable, and they voted for health care. They voted for cap and trade. And what we found was sort of on average a district that was 45 to 50 percent for Obama. Uh, if you voted no on health care, uh, you got 41 percent of the vote. Uh, if you voted yes on health care, you got 41 percent. If you voted against it, you got up 50 percent. So, in a rather systematic analysis, which I won't bore the audience with, uh, it turns out that our belief is that... Uh, you know about our belief? You're talking our about... Our belief, uh, a paper with, with Professor uh, Morris Fiorina and Douglas Rivers. 
where we make an estimate of how much did it cost the Democrats and Obama to have pushed health care and cap and trade. And our best bet is that it's about 23 to 25 seats, which is the difference between the model. So the facts are that if you uh, came from a district that was moderate or conservative, you voted for health care and cap and trade, you greatly enhanced your chances of losing. And, and, and the point is that the representatives, Democrats, who voted against health care and who voted against cap and trade, they had a much higher probability of staying in office. How many of, were there of that group, roughly? How many Democrats voted against both of those? Is that a uh, about fifteen or twenty, and then there was a bunch who there's a bunch who swung their vote. So of the seven people who voted yes on the first health care and then switched to no, six of those got reelected. Of the six who switched and went the other way, no on the first, yes on the second, uh, in the house, uh, five of those lost. Okay. So all of the data, and so another example, the class of two thousand and six, that huge class of new Democrats. 87% of them, law, uh, the 2008 class, 87% of them lost, and about 80% of them voted for uh, health care and cap and trade. So they came in enthusiastically on the coattails of a charismatic postpartisan president yeah. who pushed an agenda that was not in line with their seats, uh, their exactly. districts, yeah. rather than uh, increase their chances of Re-election, they fell on their sword, voted nobly for what they thought were their presidents and their principles, and are out of a job. We're out of a job. Yeah, I'm not sure it's so much the principles. I'd actually like to believe that, but I, I believe they miscalculated okay. uh, the election. They misread the results. They, Simpler. <laughs> I thought the 2010 election, well, you're an economist, so you like those parsimonious explanations. Uh, they're not always right, but, but, they're, <laughs> but they're parsimonious. But they're parsimonious. Yeah. So uh, another interpretation is uh, they, mis they misread the 2008 election, thought it was a change in the country moolah. I read the 2008 election as uh, not that the country shifted to the left, simply that the country had not liked the Bush presidency. The same independents we're talking about, they didn't like Bush. Uh, the swing toward the Democratic Party that you could see in the polls in 2006 came from people who didn't like Bush, but didn't mean they suddenly become liberal. They just didn't like the war, they didn't like the way the economy was moving, and so they were inclined and did vote for Obama. And, and so in the 2010 election, I think uh, that, the, the, that the Republicans uh, have misinterpreted that election, too. I think the 2010 election wasn't a mandate for Republicans or, or the Tea Party. It said, it said to the Democrats and the president, enough of that. We don't want any more spending. The health care plan, we didn't like the health care plan. We don't like cap and trade, slow which, down. of course, didn't pass. It was a slow, slow down. Exactly. Slow down. But the Republicans have clearly interpreted it as a mandate to... Well, 80, 85 or so have, uh, the Tea Party have interpreted it as a mandate. But it is, one of the most amazing questions in politics is, how does that happen? How, how do people... <laughs> why does that always happen, that uh, Clinton gets in and over uh, overinterprets the election result, uh, overreaches, and then loses big in 94... And then uh, Republicans get a uh, big victory in 94, first time they've held the Congress. So they overreach. Yeah. Then 2004, Bush comes in. Well, I built this capital up from the election. Overreaches. Obama overreaches. Uh, it's it, it, how people interpret elections. Uh, that is a great puzzle. That we, because you know, if, if you think like an economist, you'd have to say, well, why don't they? They they know what they're why they won, and here's what it is. Why why does that not happen? Yeah. Well, being a parsimonious guy, uh, yeah. <laughs> my, my thought would be not so – well, there's no they there. So the way I would interpret it, and you'd like to get your reaction, uh, nobody owns it. So in, in private sector transactions, we could debate whether this holds widely or narrowly, but certainly in many private sector transactions, if you overreach, say, as an individual, you pay, pay a serious price. So you, you think you're going to be a – an NBA player, and you're five six, and there are, there are one or two who've done yeah. it, but it's very rare. But you know, you got a lot of confidence, and the world slaps you down, and it slaps you down lots of places. It slaps yeah. you down in high school, it slaps yeah. you down in college. Yeah. Eventually, you learn. In, in, in politics, obviously, learning is hard because there are few comebacks. Yeah. You're kind of yeah. out. That's one problem. But I do think the bigger problem is is that 
it, it's 435 representatives, 100 senators, a president, a bunch of infrastructure and powerful people, donors. They don't coordinate very well. There are no f the usual feedback loops are not as strong as they might be. Yeah. And a lot of the individuals have an incentive to overreach in certain circumstances, but as a group, that's not what they really want to do uh, because there's no residual claimant like there would be in a, yeah. somebody owning a business who thinks that uh, you know, they're going to dominate the world. So part of it, I think, is just human hubris, right? But it's the hubris combined with not enough feedback loops along the way. Of course, the counterpoint is, what do you mean no feedback loops? <laughs> These guys lose their jobs. Wouldn't that induce... What is the political portrait we always hear? It they're risk averse, they're cautious. Well, the ones that History. keep getting elected are. But I, yeah. Yeah, I would add. So I don't disagree with what you said. I would just add to it. The problem is that where's the feedback loop come from? The strongest feedback comes from uh, the people who provide the juice, i.e., the donors and the ideas. So if you actually ask where the juice came from in the 2010 election, it came from the Tea Party. Right. The ideas, the so on, so so that what they're hearing, so that there's a feedback loop, but the feedback loop very noisy is, and, and is, is, biased. is noisy and biased. And on the Democratic side, it tends to be the Soros and the left faction, and, and it draw, it pulls each of the parties uh, further toward the right and toward the left than you normally expect. So I, I think probably the feedback main feedback mechanism comes there. So the plus the fact they they're they're willing on this. The when you talk to some rep, like the guy from Wisconsin that replaced Dave Obi, okay, after Obi's like forty some years in Congress, uh, he is torn on this tax thing because he wants a solution, but he's been threatened by the Tea Party in his district that they'll if he votes for any of this they'll run a pri he'll run a primary opponent, and he's in his first term so he hasn't built up a base of support that can get him through those primaries. So the combination of their vulnerability, I mean, most of the people who lose are in their first or second term, haven't built up that uh, district level thing yet, and, and the pressure coming, just the, your, your explanation, but the feedback comes from a more biased source. Uh, yeah, non-representative. Yeah. Well, the, uh, April, there's an April electorate and there's a November electorate. And uh, the November electorate is what's not getting represented, not, yeah. not in the feedback loop. Yeah, so that's interesting. Of course, a thoughtful politician mm -hmm. would anticipate that and, and would uh, the best ones obviously do. Yeah. But you raise an interesting point. We've probably talked about this in the past. The classical um, standard model of, of political competition and other types of competition when you have two opponents against one against the other they move to the center this is goes back to work of Harold Hotelling yep. uh, the two ice cream vendors on the beach yep. move to the middle and that way they get everybody to one side and the same thing is true in politics move to the center if you're a, a Democrat the left isn't going to vote for the Republican you move to the right if you're a Republican the left's not right. going to vote for you anyway right. but uh, you move to the center and then you get all the right but but the that doesn't seem to be happening as much. We see this, as you said, the people seem to move to the extremes, and yet everybody knows, quote, everybody knows what you've been implying all along, which is partisanship is, it seems, smaller. Ident party identification seems less intense. Independents seem more important. Generally, that would encourage politicians to move to the center. Why don't yeah, they? Well, I think the problem is uh, the United States is the only country that has um, democracy within the party. That is, if you look at the European uh, countries, they have the uh, Christian Democrats in uh, Germany take on the uh, Socialist Party, uh, and the Tories take on Labour in England, but the, the facts are that uh, you get the nomination through party activists for the district. In the United States, uh, you have to win two elections. You have to win a primary election. And, think, and so in the primary election, you're running against other Democrats or Republicans. That means you have to put your own team together. You have to raise your own money. You have to get your own pollsters. You have to get your own campaign map. So then when you win the primary, you're not going to suddenly turn and say, oh, you guys are all gone. I'm going to get the party people. So the unique thing about the United States is this, this competition within the district has always uh, meant that uh, they have to, uh, co U.S. congressmen and congresswomen have to build up, as do senators, a primary constituency which will get, protect them in April. 
Then there's the, and that might, and, and beginning in the 70s, as single interest groups started out in, with the environmentalists in, uh, Colorado, when they, uh, didn't like, uh, some of the Colorado Democrats, they, uh, defeated them in the primary. So, uh, the right and the left in the Democratic Party can pull, uh, pull, pull a member to the right because we'll run against you in April. Doesn't matter whether you're popular in November. And so congressmen and congresswomen are constantly balancing the two. How do I pick the right spot between? And so I think on the Republican side, think pro-life, right? Uh, why, why are there so few? It, in California, 74% of Republican party identifiers are pro-choice. Why are so few California Republicans in Congress pro-choice? And the answer is because they know that if they vote uh, pro-choice or too pro-choice, they will uh, gin up a pro-life uh, opponent in the primary. And on the Democratic side, there's all sorts of issues on race, etc., that are the uh, the equivalent of that. But the standard view argument, I think, I think it's, I think I've heard it attributed to Richard Nixon, but he's certainly not the first person to think it or say it. Is you know, in the primaries, you you run to the extreme, and then you run back to the center. Right. So are they not as good at that as they used to be? Is it is it harder to to create a nuanced picture? Well, I think that what's happened, uh, and you know, this is that nuance, by the way, is it meaning dishonest, right? No, I well, <laughs> I, no, I, I mean, no, I get that, but I mean, the the point is, you used to be able, you ran to the right, and then got to the middle, uh, and you can still do that at the presidential level in some way. You have to, but I think what's happened is that uh, at the congressional level. The, the rise, so if you look at the way interest groups score, it used to be in the old days you could get a score for a member of Congress, and the scores were Americans for Democratic Action. That started in 1946. And the, yeah, those yeah. guys, they'd pick around and they'd, yeah, ADA, they'd, they'd pick 20 issues in a given session, and they'd say, here's the liberal position, and then they'd score you. If you voted with them 19 times, you had a 95. If you voted with them 10, you had 50, and so on. And there was the, the labor uh, cope. There were very few scores. Beginning in the 70s, all of a sudden, the League of Conservation Voters, National Taxpayers Union, all these events, at about the same time the Congress opened up the process. They decided on open votes. They used to have a vote in Congress where members would stand in the back, line up, and then move through without being recorded. Just to get a sense of where things were. Yes. No, it would, you could use that as a final vote. Oh. So there'd be a vote. Quiet vote. Yeah, it'd be a quiet <laughs> vote so I could protect the vote. So I'll give you an example of that. So <clears throat> there was a congressman from San Diego who would always introduce a bill saying that military, San Diego has a lot of military people. This is in the 60s and early 70s before they did this openness. He'd always introduce a bill saying, uh, Gee, uh, we need to uh, make all of our military pensions cost of living adjustable. Well, that was a huge cost given all the military p pensions and plus the uh, health care and so on. And it would always get killed by Eddie Aber, who was the long-term Democratic chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. It'd just get killed. So the guy had the ability to say, I brought it up and it got killed. But under the new rules, it's harder and harder to hide that. If you bring it up like that and you, the, the committee chair can't kill it anymore, there's a vote on it and that, again, it seems to me that pushes people to, and I've been on, on the floor listening to the guy, I remember Gillis Long of Louisiana once saying, how's my Americans for Constitutional Action score before he we went out? He didn't want to have too low a score on that. Which was a conservative Yes, group. he didn't want to have a low score on that. So members are constantly trying to balance those two things, but I think since the 70s, this openness in Congress and which is everybody thought was a great thing, and uh, the second and and, and a, a great economist uh, Joseph Schumpeter in Socialism, Capitalism, Democracy, or Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy, yeah, whichever yeah. it is, yeah. he has this great argument uh, about democracy that his view is you should uh, have an election, and then for the next four years no one can talk to Congress because they should just go back to the electorate because his view is the interest groups will distort the sort of information they have. Hmm. So, and that didn't used to be such a problem in the U.S., uh, but it, 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 it actually is, is now, and congressmen and women have to try and balance those two things, and, and, and the pressure 
from the extremes is uh, harder now than it was. And you're seeing that in the budget. Uh, you're seeing that in the budget. Uh, not a budget, but you're seeing the that debt in ceiling. the debt ceiling. So in this debate, <clears throat> let's use this as an example, the hard to really know what's going on, of course. We're, we're, it's filtered through <clears throat> media biases of political spin, a thousand things. But the story, as it appears to be, is, is, is this strange conjunction of perhaps negotiating, maneuvering, or principle, who knows. But on the one side, we have the Senate and the, and the President, both Democratic, who have not put forward... Uh, I, the Senate has not submitted a budget, and the President has not laid out in any kind of detail what his preferred outcome is. The Republicans, there's a very vocal minority of the 80 or so folks you mentioned before who seem to be saying, we would be happy either if the U.S. semi-defaulted, whatever this actual thing that happens turns out to be, by on August 2nd, or massive or at least significant or at least actual cuts. There doesn't seem to be any compromising going on here that we would normal the horse trading that we'd normally at least at least hear about. Maybe it's happening we aren't hearing about it. Um, th those are very difficult positions to to compromise on. Yeah. I think right? that's what the press focuses on. Let me by now. So in uh, and I'll come back to the present crisis. But in 1990, when uh, George Herbert Walker Bush um, had made the promise of read my lips, no new taxes. But then in 1990, he agreed to uh, tax increases. And uh, he dealt with the uh, Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate and uh, tried to get, they put a package together uh, that was uh, so, uh, X percentage of cuts in uh, spending and uh, X percentage of cuts in taxes. <coughs> Increases in taxes. Increase in taxes, sorry, yeah. So what happened was Newt Gingrich didn't like the tax increases, so he led the Republicans in the House against it. <coughs> Ron Dellums and the Democrats, who didn't like the nature of the cuts, so they tried to build an inside-out, middle-out coalition that got beat by the left and the right. So then the Senate passed its bill, which was uh, a higher increase in taxes, lower cuts, the House had to deal with the bill, and the Democrats got a better bill. What I think is happening with... And then the, George Bush signed it, yes. despite his pledge, right? and, quote, became a one-term president. Exactly. He may have been a one-term president. So anyway. everybody remembers that. So I think what John Boehner has done is a couple of things. Um, I think he backed away from the grand uh, three-to-one, four-trillion-dollar thing that the president was proposing because that was never going to pass. He just couldn't get that. that in the House. Pass. He in would never House. get Republican. So uh, what he's done is he's got a proposal that was not voted on yesterday. They canceled at 6 o'clock. And his proposal has a couple of features. One of them, there's uh, $1.2 trillion in cuts, but there's a promise within six months they'll uh, put a committee together to make uh, $1.8 trillion or so more in cuts. But the more important thing is that uh, at the end of six months, There'll be another vote, and it'll give members a second chance to vote no on uh, increased expenditures, but the president, by simply vetoing it, will be able to raise the thing. So it's kind of a political compromise that does that. Uh, so, and, and from his view, and, and the difference between the Reid plan and his plan is, isn't so bad. So, you know, the, the president's press conference, he talked about, well, the rich should pay more, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the problem with that is, uh, the president, if that's the case, the Democrats have a majority in the Senate. Why don't they just put those increases in? Well, because they don't have the votes. There are 12 or 13 Democratic senators like Nelson, running, who's running from Nebraska, who will not buy that. So the Reed plan uh, is a little different than the other, but essentially the Reed plan has no new taxes in it. And it has uh, uh, differences like they plan on spending less on the war, the wars, but, but those are just the details. So if Boehner can't pass his bill, what happens is read the Democrats pass that bill, then that goes to the House, and they'll not be able to uh, get back, and it'll look like 1990. My view is there will be a con They're not going to let it go. They're going to bankrupt. The, the stock market's fallen five straight days. Uh, the big banks, everybody is saying, if you don't do this, there's such consequence to doing it. So they're going to get a deal. 
I think the worst thing about all this is the 24-7 coverage right. by the news media who don't really know exactly what's going on. And, and imagine if you were in a parliamentary system, you'd have, be having the same disputes, right? But it'd be worked out within one party, right? Because on a parliamentary system, unless it's multi-party, you get that. But in the United States, because you got divided government, because of the nature of our system, it's all in the open. Everything, every, every little move, maneuver is in the open, whereas in Japan or Britain, that would be going on internally. And we did a recent podcast with Keith Hennessy on the deta- some of the details of this, uh, which I encourage listeners to, to go hear if you didn't hear it the first time through. What I, don't, what I find strange about it, though, is that Let's go back to the, the, the extreme folks who may be overreading the election. Of course, for their district, they might not be. But for these 80-something fresh right. freshmen in the Republican caucus, um, they seem like they're actually going to not vote for something that doesn't have actual cuts. Um, that's going to make it a lot harder to compromise. Because some of these cuts that we're talking yeah. we're using the word cuts like they're cuts. But some of them aren't cuts. As Keith pointed out in that podcast, Keith Hennessy, some are cuts from a baseline that includes, assumes a lot of stuff that isn't going to happen really. So it's not really a cut. Uh, they ignore Medicare issues that they're not going to really, aren't really real. Uh, they've got forecast big growth. They're going to cut from that. So it's not even a real cut at all. But if those Republicans don't, you got to get the House to compromise on that bill. If those 80 something people aren't going to compromise, they have a lot of power. Well, or no, or they, they have, give? Uh, no, they have the they can they can stop the Boehner plan, but after the Boehner plan, the reason the Boehner plans weaken is you know the Democrats have members in the House too, so when the Senate bill comes down, are there forty fifty Republicans who like Dave Dreyer of uh, California who are going to be moderate enough to say we are not going to let the country go? So the coalition that won uh, the coalition that back to nineteen ninety. Uh, the co- what the how the vote passed in the House was it passed uh, by virtue of a Democratic majority with some Republicans. So that'll happen. You think that'll happen again? It'll be a lot of Rep- moderate Republicans with they're conservative have, yeah. Democrats. I think they're not going to sit around and say we're going to. I mean, because the consequences of uh, I think the consequences of not uh, raising the debt ceiling are are not going to be good. Could now some markets people, don't like it. I'm not going to go into the economics of it, but I, I can read markets. They don't like it. You could, we could debate whether that's true, but I, I, I'm agnostic about yeah. it. But clearly, if you're a member of Congress, you really don't want to find out. If, I, if that would be my view. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, and clearly, the leadership would bear a serious brunt. The leadership as well. would bear so the they brunt wanna, of it. They've got an incentive. You're yeah. suggesting to come to some agreement. That the president will sign, even if he has to hold his nose. Yeah, the, R- Ronald Reagan uh, signed. Uh, you know, we've done this. All. One of the problems uh, with this that uh, I found out from John Cogan, who was deputy director of OMB under Reagan, was in the past the way they used to do these things was well, you had twelve trillion dollars worth of debt, and seven and five five trillion was in uh, seven trillion wanted to raise the cap. One way you used to be able to do it was take of your five trillion in debt Social Security, you write three uh, write two billion of it off and put it over there, two trillion of it off over there, and it, the cap could be raised that way. Because that's sort but, of funny money debt yeah, anyway. In nineteen ninety five. They eliminated that prospect. Interesting. So that makes it a lot harder to do. It makes it real. It makes it, in some sense, real numbers yeah, or is, real numbers by Washington yeah. standards. <laughs> but I, look, the, the point is, they'll sign it because uh, I think both sides uh, think they have an advantage going into 2012. The president thinks that uh, he can win these centrist voters. Uh, Running and, against the intransigent Republicans. Yes, and the Republicans think they can win by virtue of hanging tough on spending, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and neither side, I think, is prepared for the fallout from what will uh, happen if the United States uh, start doing, starts, uh, it just says they can't, uh, starts Pay defaulting its, on something. Yeah, yeah, we're not paying all of its promises. Yeah. That's not... Uh, and and uh, the the the, uh, our, the U.S. rating, which has been AAA, will go down. Yep. That will cause in, it'll make the budget difficulties in the future even harder. So I, I just don't see how they can not make a deal. Of course, you're assuming they're rational, but which we said earlier is 
Well, you only have to have 218 to, yeah. you know, to get there, or 216, actually. There's two members. Uh, yeah. Two there members four, that are what? Four members that are uh, deaths and so on. So you only need 216 oh, okay. votes this time. Um, let's look ahead now a little, fur- a little further. Um, let's first talk some presidential politics. Talk about some of the specifics of the Republican nominating process, what's changed, and how that affects... Uh, who gets an edge and who doesn't. Okay, the normal procedure um, for uh, nominations uh, has been the first four primaries are retail. That is, candidates have to go out and actually meet. uh, You know, every voter in New Hampshire has had lunch or dinner with every candidate at some point. So uh, they're small. So the Iowa caucuses, you have to go to the caucus, you have to talk. And so, so the first four are retail. That is, you really, you, they're not states that you can win with big TV campaigns. So California would be a terrible state to have retail because you can't have retail. But if California was one of the first four, it'd just all be uh, TV. So those first four, and the idea of the first four is you get down to the, you sort out, there's seven or eight candidates, you get down to the final, you get down to two. And then after that, uh, there, there's uh, starting in, uh, if you consider the 2008 uh, an example, uh, there was Super Tuesday. And then Super Tuesday, there's a one big event where you got a lot of primaries, and that's supposed to decide the winner. So and that's that, going to be a mix of retail and yeah, wholesale because right. there's, you can't exactly. cover every state. Anyway exactly. And, so, and that's, there's a lot of strategy there because so there's a test. Are, it's yes, testing but, on your ability to raise money because you're going to have to. Exactly. But the idea is at the end of that Super Tuesday, you got a candidate. So they don't have to be Kill too far other. right or too far left. They can get back to the center. And exactly they can't beat the each other up for the full. Yeah. And what happened with September. Obama and Hillary, they carried it on, carried it on, carried it on uh, for too, uh, too long. They couldn't get it. Now, the Republicans haven't had as big a problem in getting a winner, as you saw in 2008 with McCain Very essentially quickly, yeah. uh, winning. And the reason is because the Republican states... Uh, Republican had winner-take-all states, i.e. Democrats when the vote. So I'll give you an example. On Super Tuesday, Hillary Clinton ended up with, I think, six, 800,000 more votes than Barack Obama. But in terms of electoral college ballots, uh, they were dead even. The reason is it's proportional. If you win California 55-45, you get 55-45. But Obama, so Obama lost on that, but he gained in Idaho and a bunch of states that were caucus states where he was better organized. So the end result of that day was dead even in an electoral college, even though he'd lost by 800,000 votes. Now, the Republicans didn't have that When you say electoral college, you mean primary? Uh, it, not electoral college, yeah. but for the, for the Demo- for Repo- Democratic nomination, nomination. Co- uh, co- a committee. And not the committee, but the Democratic convention. Yeah. Well, so what happened uh, for the Republicans is didn't happen because they had winner take all. So if you won by one vote in New Hampshire, that's you what got you all got. The, all the you points. won by one vote in Florida, you got them all. Well, the Republicans have changed that this year. Oh. So if and at, with the pressure of everybody trying to move the primaries up and get a say earlier, so in February uh, there's going to be four 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 uh, primaries: uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. Very disparate geographically. Yes, all small, all retail sort of politics. And uh, then other states, Florida, and everybody else trying to push up early. If you go into March, you, under the new Republican rules, you have a proportional primary. So the first, Not, yeah. four, the first four are still winner take all? The first four, I believe, are still... Uh, no, the first four, it varies state by state, but... Uh, because the first four doesn't really matter because all you're trying to do is sort out and get to the two. Who are the two candidates? Who are the who are the players? Right? You get right. we're getting rid of the street sweepers and we're down to the players. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but after then, uh, then in March, if you so if you move your primary into March, uh, it's proportional. Okay. It's so that means only in April can you have those things. Still, some states might want to move into March. We don't know yet the full story, if they move into March, it's proportional. That would change the campaign for people because they'd be campaigning, but they wouldn't, it wouldn't be decisive. So it could extend the... It extends the, the season. Who wins yeah. the... Yeah, yeah, too many get in March, you don't get enough... Uh, too many move into March, you don't get a uh, big enough winner, so you don't... So the campaign can extend out and they take each other on, and that's not... The longer it goes in general, 
So yeah. naive question. Uh, you mean the states haven't already decided when their primaries are? No, no, they can. They can they're move still them maneuvering. Yeah, yeah, they're still okay. maneuvering. Yeah, plenty uh, of time. So, in those first four, which will could be decisive, it could turn out could that be, someone yes. dominates. Yeah, but they're very. But I dis- doubt it. But they're well. One reason being, and I've heard this from you before yeah. we recorded this. There's ve- there's a lot of differences in those states. Yeah. Certain candidates are going to have an edge. So. What are the key issues in those states? That well, are Iowa, say nobody's running. Say again? In Iowa, uh, Romney's not running in Iowa. Literally. Uh, no. I mean, not showing up. He's not, no, he's not running. He's not competing in yeah. Iowa. Yeah. Um, and others are not. Uh, two main competitors in Iowa are Palenti and Michelle Bachman from n- nearby Minnesota. Iowa is a uh, caucus state. Uh, so it's small, local meetings, we have to be a party member, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that states tend to be dominated by uh, social conservatives, uh, very Christian. And so... Uh, Michelle Bachman's going to clean Pelosi's block. It looks like probably. it at this point, but uh, he's he's campaigning hard there. Then, then that, you could moved make, it. that could make it, could even push his numbers lower. But Right, uh, good. But then you go to New Hampshire... And that is pretty much uh, conceded to Romney. It's close to him. He's ahead in the polls. And moreover, uh, New Hampshire is an open primary state. And with Obama not probably going to have any opposition, you'll get uh, Democrats coming in and voting in that uh, primary. And uh, it, like McCain did well. That, then you get to the and Nevada. Is, you know, Nevada is a kind of an interesting state. Uh, the Democrats put it in because there's a lot of Hispanics and there's, it's a big union state because of the Las Vegas and Reno. And, uh, but the Republicans uh, have it in because it's a big Tea Party state for them right. in some senses. Western. <clears throat> it's Western. And, but the big one then is going to be South Carolina. So if you assume Pawlenty or somebody, uh, uh, Bachman wins uh, Iowa. Uh, Romney, Romney wins, wins New Hampshire. Who's going to win? Nevada's not big enough. Eh, nobody knows it's that. Not be. But the key is South Carolina. For uh, for some time now, whoever won the South Carolina primary won the Republican nomination, uh, and that's where George Bush in 2000, after he lost to uh, McCain in uh, New Hampshire, uh, came back and uh, won South Carolina, and then won. Now uh, South Carolina is a, is a Republican primary. That's you got to be a Republican, so that's a test. So independents can't, but non-registered. Yeah, right. Well, there's, there, you know, each state is so complicated, but basically the way to think of South Carolina is it's a Republican-only state. Only, and it's a conservative state. Yes, it is. So uh, it's a combination of economic and social conservative. So how do you, so you get everybody campaigning pretty hard. But, uh, so then at the end of those four, who's left? Well, Romney maybe because he won New Hampshire. He He's could got still a lot be alive, of money. and he might win. <clears throat> but you so notice much. that uh, on this debt crisis, Romney has said nothing. Yeah, I haven't Bachman heard Bachman has well, and I think that's pretty smart of him actually. Yeah. Uh, Michelle Bachman has said she won't vote for it on her, and that's she, she's she playing said, to the base. Yeah. She said she's <clears throat> going to not vote for any increase, no matter what the terms are. Yeah. I think. I, right. She well, said, that's, I think she's she against said. raising the debt, right. right? Which so, is an interesting position. Well, but the point is that is going to appeal in. Uh, to her, that's yeah. going to appeal to the base she has. So then you come out of that. Uh, you come out of that uh, with uh, maybe a couple candidates: uh, Romney, Bachman. Uh, you know who's going to come up? Perry may get in the race. Uh, Seems to be. But I think for the uh, for me, the election is uh, it's going to be an interesting election because. The best economic and political science models of elections that work, going back to about 1888, do two things. You assume, how's the economy doing? You can imagine among academics there's arguments about that, whether it's the consumer price index, growth of real income six months before. But whatever it is, the combination of the Ray Fair, who's an economist at Yale model, and uh, Doug Hibbs, a political scientist, who added uh, the butter, guns and butter. And the guns part of that is how many U.S. troops are abroad at any given point in time. Hmm. And so with that, so the two elections that were really hard to explain in the modern era were 1952 and 1968 and 72. 68. And the reason is because of Vietnam and Korea. So when you put those in, that model works pretty well. And that model, I just saw Doug, Doug just sent a note out. That model says at this point, uh, Barack Obama could expect 46.6% of the vote. Not good. Right. But uh, no one I know believes that. Sure. And, and the reason is, the reason is, well, I don't think the economy will have recovered enough to give him on the model. 
a uh, winner. So she got the economic guns and butter model, which has worked very well, actually, over uh, historical time, with the uh, sort of old maxim in uh, political science, which is you can't beat somebody with nobody. And, yeah. uh, and a good example of that is Pete Wilson, who was governor of California, in his last uh, run, his run for re-election. He had a 33% approval rating. Looks like a lost cause. And uh, he won by approximately 10% <laughs> over Kathleen Brown, who uh, go- got present governor's uh, sister, uh, who did not run a good campaign, even though uh, she's a perfectly intelligent, uh, charming woman, but the can- she wasn't in the campaign. But the point is, you can be not you get very a bad approved, and you can get yeah. beat. Yeah. <clears throat> and frankly, uh, whoever the Republican is, if it's Bachman, I, I, don't, I, pers- I don't see how Bachman could win a national election. Agreed. Uh, Romney, possibly, but he's got a lot of baggage. The old flip-flop, he's going to have a harder time in the primary than people think. I don't know how he's going to play in New Hampshire. and I mean, not New Hampshire, but in South Carolina. <coughs> and I guess the other thing I'd say is the fact is that uh, there is uh, bias against Mormons. Uh, when we run our experiments, uh, we show uh, 10 to 15% of people who say they won't vote for a Mormon for president. That's an issue that's handicap. not going away. Yeah. So uh, I think the uh, 2012 election, presidential election is uh, no given thing for either party. Both got problems. Yeah. I think the president has seen um, that he wanted to get to the center. I think when he moved for the let's get the $3 trillion, $4 trillion in savings, I'm willing to give three in cuts for one. And I think that was just his move to uh, say, look, I'm willing to compromise. I understand spending's a problem, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the Republicans weren't buying it because much of that deal was, oh, we'll lower the rates to 29% next. We'll talk about that next year. And secondly... You know, his first budget was a straight baseline. Uh, baseline didn't take any cuts off, and then he agreed that he made a mistake. That but where to spend? So he made this speech, but never submitted a lower a budget. budget yeah. So I think the Republicans, when he finally came in the game, I thought they were thinking, you know, well, this is not, this is not. We don't believe it. So uh, the combination of those things make this a particularly difficult uh, thing. But but his strategy is clear. But let's go back to the Republican nomination. What, what strikes me as strange about it given our session earlier conversation is the front runner is Romney who on paper is not who you'd think the April Republican base would push for uh, Bachman is closer to that but she's got other problems lack of experience too extreme for many people certainly for many independents um, it it's surprising to me that no Republican candidate has stepped forward who can hit the president where he's most vulnerable, which is on spending in the economy. Mm-hmm. Romney has this public image of competency he likes to sell, but he's got his own health care baggage, which the base is very unhappy, the Republican base is right. very unhappy exactly. about. <clears throat> he's got no real economic story of success to sell the way past governors have even if they didn't earn right. it he can't he doesn't yeah. have it um you know i thought i thought mitch daniels was the best candidate on paper there's always issues of campaigning he's got personal issues so that he's out uh is anyone out rick perry may be that person but who knows he's untested rick Everyone perry, thinks he's gonna rick, win yeah. because he's not <laughs> romney or, or brockman but there's no reason he might that. but rick perry uh, you know texas has uh trying bad texas's deficit is actually now bigger than california's because California picked up $11 billion in new taxes from these IPOs. Uh, so Perry's got some baggage, and not clear that he's actually going to run. I think the trouble is the best Republican the candidates who could go after him, uh, Mitch Daniels, Chris Christie of New Jersey. Uh, who go Daniels, after Obama. Yeah, Daniels uh, dropped out uh, for whatever reason. And Chris Christie, I believe, just genuinely uh, doesn't think he knows enough to be president yet. He knows about New Jersey. He doesn't know the issues well enough. And so I think he's uh, going to continue to deal with New Jersey. He's not going to run. This puts him in a very small group. Yes. A number of successful politicians who don't think they know enough to do yes, that's something right. else. Uh, that's shocking. <laughs> that's true. But, it's, I, you know, I have, uh, I have uh, met him. And uh, actually, Bob Grady, who heads his Council of Economic Advisors, assures me that that's his view. And, and I, I trust Bob. And he has other 
reasons I think yep. for not running. He, he he's um, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's un- very unlikely. Yeah. So I don't I don't see uh, a knight in shining armor on the Republican side riding forward. The question is going to be if the economy doesn't get better or if it gets worse, is the Republican alternative uh, no matter how better. unpalatable yeah, it is yeah, to many yeah. people, yeah. will it's, they hold it's their nose? It's going to be the. It's going to be they're going to. It's going to be kind of in that sense for the average, the independent. It's going to be the lesser of two evils. But for but and they will be clearly. The they're going to decide this election and have been for some some time. And the guns and butter, which will be what's going on in Afghanistan, Libya, et cetera, and what's going on with the unemployment rate and the debt, whatever fallout there is from the current mess. Those are going to be the decisive issues. You think health care, other side issues, they're not going to be as salient? No, I think the big, the big issues, other than how they all play into the new four-letter word in Washington, <clears throat> which is math, that you cannot, uh, we can't sustain the spending levels that yeah. we have, uh, and that means some combination of cuts and probably uh, tax increases in whatever form. That could be eliminating yeah. uh, the employer deduction on uh, health care. There's a lot of ways to do that. Good idea. But, uh, the, but the bottom line is, I, and I think the way it's going to come up in the election is jobs. They're going to, the Republicans are going to bang away at the president on uh, why there aren't more jobs. And uh, that that's going to be the the key issue. And the reason they're going to claim is because there's too much spending, too much health care, all those sorts of things are going to play into what that. Will, what will his response be to that? What do you think his best, the public response from the defenders of, of the economic policies have been, well, the economy is worse, worse than we thought. Mm. It's George Bush's problem. We inherited it. And that's a hard sell. It's a bad sell, and I don't think that's what they're going to do. I think they're going to run against uh, they're going to run against the Republicans as extremists. Uh-huh. They're going to run against the uh, if it's Michelle Bachman, you can see where the run there is. Yeah. Uh, if it's Mitt Romney, you can see the flip flopping. Which 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 Mitt Romney am I running against? The guy that was not anti gay union, but now that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. And he's and a, the fact that. Look at the Republican Party. They want to take away your Social Security benefits. Yeah. They want the Ryan plan will. So they're going to run. They can't run on, their, on the positives that the economy has turned around. So they're going to have to run against Republicans. Yeah. That's well, their only strategy. Could work. Could. Um, it'll be an incredibly um, interesting um, year, I'm sure. Let's close with the discussion of some issues that... Uh, you've done a lot of work on, which is uh, the idea of uh, sort of a watershed election, a historic realignment. In 2008, the election of Barack Obama, which was historic for many reasons, yeah. race being the most obvious, but a lot of people imagined that we were in a new era, mm-hmm. post-partisanship, uh, the Republican Party was really in, in shambles because of the dislike of the president who was on his way out. Uh, and a, a presidential candidate, uh, John McCain, who had nothing really constructive to say about the central issue of the of the of that moment, which was the yeah. financial crisis. Yeah. And in one view, it, it's shocking how much vote, how well he did, uh, given those two those two facts. Um, but that didn't happen. Two thousand eight was not a watershed. It wasn't was a revolution. T- talk about what times when there have been such elections and why they're rare and why people tend to overestimate their likelihood. Well, in the the most recent one was uh, 1932 where... Not the, so recent. Yeah, <laughs> well, not so recent, but the one that's sort of clearly you can identify. So what happens is at the level of the individual, uh, the for the Republican Party had been dominant for really since the Civil War, with the exception of the... Uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was only elected president because Teddy Roosevelt ran against Taft, uh, and so uh, Wilson was uh, a thirty uh, percent of the vote, uh, and then he won a re-election in 1960 narrowly. Uh, but basically, from the Civil War on, uh, with the exception of um, Wilson 
and Grover Cleveland. Who kind of doesn't uh, count. Who kind of doesn't because he was more Republican in some ways than were, yep. pro-gold standard, et yep. cetera, et cetera. Uh, the Republicans had dominated. So what happened in 32 is the... Uh, That's a good uh, run. That's a 70-year yes. run. A majority of Americans uh, switched their party affiliation from Republican to Democrat. Uh, when, when the Democrats get in on the key issues of the day... So the key issues of the day are what's to be done about the Depression. Will there be an active government? And the government then got into agricultural assistance, social uh, welfare. Uh, retirement. Uh, retirement, planning the economy, Social Security, Works Projects Administration, uh, CCC. They did all of those things as a plan. So the question was, before the election, welfare or no welfare? And then when the Democrats won and moreover kept winning and controlled the Congress and the presidency for 14 years till 1946, then won it back in 48, uh, the other party is sort of faced to move. So the Republicans have to go from no welfare to uh, less welfare. welfare. So the Democrats (laughs) are the party of more and the Republicans are the party of less. And that's held pretty steady. The closest to a realignment was Ronald Reagan. Uh, but, you know, he never got the House of Representatives. He never had that. Uh, they never won that. It wasn't until 1994 that the Congress had, uh, and it wasn't until That's 2000 true. that the Republicans ever had control of President, House, and Senate. And uh, So so that so, was a 70-year run for the se- Democrats yes, in some sense. Yes, a long run for the Democrats. So uh, why hasn't that why hasn't it ha- uh, happened? Because uh, one part of the nature of politics, the po- congressmen and congresswomen, uh, learn to run apart from the party. They do run on the basis of the personal vote. They go home and do all sorts. And, and on, on several papers, we've shown that the personal vote doesn't develop until the mid-60s, probably the 50s. Personal vote for the representative as yes. opposed to the so party of the pers- So that, so that in, in, prior to 19, <clears throat> prior to 19, 64, say, when was the first time we know we can measure this accurately, uh, Prior to 64, a 6% swing uh, to one party brings that uh, party, the president, uh, the House, and the Senate. Post-64, uh, it doesn't do anything like that. So you can have huge victories for uh, Richard president, Nixon yeah. in 72, Ronald Reagan in 80, Ronald Reagan in 84. No more coattails. And, and th- yeah, because uh, congressmen run individually. And uh, <clears throat> that personal vote Particularly after the South switched to the Democrat, away from the Democrats to the Republicans at the presidential level. Uh, a lot of Democratic congressmen hung in, and you had a lot of voting where Southern Democrats would vote with, uh, <clears throat> Republicans on, on, uh, all kinds. Of, and there were a bunch, and Ronald Reagan then sort of changed, the uh, time you got a lot of the, the, there was a sorting, think about it like that, a sorting where, Prior to the 60s, you, if you were a liberal, uh, you, there could be liberal Republicans, right. like Rockefeller branch, or there could be conservative Democrats, like Henry conservative Jackson. Southerners. Scoop, or Scoop and, Jackson. Yeah, and right. So then there's a sorting. Yeah, Scoop Jackson's actually a better example. So then there's a sorting out process. So now all the liberals are in the Democratic camp and all the conservatives are in the Republican camp. And that makes things a, a little more partisan and... and uh, not as partisan as people uh, actually the press claims, but that's a different story. So, so the bottom line, uh, so the bottom line on this um, is that contemporary elections uh, are have not met the criteria because uh, congressmen have learned new tricks. Uh, in addition, the American public don't really like this so much. So that over the post World War II period, post New Deal period. We've seen a rise, steady rise of independence. Independence, sure. A steady rise. Uh, now, there's a question in political science about what that independence means, leaning Democrat, right. leaning Republican. But however you figured out, there's an increasing rise in these number of independents. And what they want is for the government to work. They don't, and they don't, well, they're not concerned about what the solution is, what the balance is. They want things to work. And they were responsible for uh, Clinton's victory in 92. They were responsible for the Republicans taking the House in 94. Uh, Clinton, uh, 96. Every election, presidential election, and, and, uh, and major congressional shift has been determined by which way the independents move. 
They moved in 2008, 2004 they were with Bush, 2000 they were with Bush, 2008 they moved against the Republicans and to Obama, 2010 they moved against Obama. They're so they're the ones that matter. But they don't vote in primaries, that's the other thing. These people don't vote in primaries. They split their ticket. They're willing to vote one way for president, another yeah. way for Congress. And they are uh, increasingly, I believe, disaffected from uh, the political process and the uh, recent uh, debt crisis that has just that, turned yeah. more and more people off. So we hear from time to time talk <clears throat> of a serious third party candidate. Not third party candidate, third party. Yeah. Uh, on the left, we've had the Green Party. On the right, we have the Tea Party is sort of a third party, kind of not. Um, but there's also been talk of a sort of centrist uh, third party in this election. I've, I've I'm not going to remember what their name is. They're called something like American Happiness. Yeah. Or, uh, and they'd have, I forget who their ticket could be, but it's a bunch of so-called Bloomberg, centrists. Probably Bloomberg. Bloomberg and yeah. Joe Lieberman. And yeah, yeah, or yeah right. Um, so that would be a party that's fiscally conservative and uh, and socially uh, tolerant. Libertarian-ish. Libertarian sort of, yeah, right. Not really. But, but not, not, not willing to eliminate not the too government far. or anything. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. Uh, what do you think the odds of that are? There's a window there, obviously. There's Very a, there, small, uh, because a high if, transaction if you cost. think about if you think about what political parties are. So, if you want to start a new party, uh, you know it's easy to get a third party candidate for president. We've done a lot of that. John Anderson affected the election. Ross Perot, Ross Perot affected the election. Teddy Roosevelt in the past uh, elections have. Uh, you can get a popular third party candidate and uh, they can and Ross Perot did it twice I mean you know yeah. it's even the second time he was in double digits George Wallace uh, yeah, Strom Thurmond yeah. so uh, third party candidates are pretty easy to run for the president building a party where you start at the grassroots level house level da 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 uh, you uh, s that is much harder to do and it's hard to do for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them, of course, is you know you got to generate the candidates and a lot of money to fund them to run. Yeah. A, they don't have to run a primary, but they have to run as a third party guy. And the second thing is, given the American electoral system, which is first past the post, so suppose you get twenty percent in the district, uh, does doesn't that, that it doesn't good. matter? You you, nothing, you're zero. never going to win over the other two. And you got to convince those donors that you're not throwing money away exactly. when you get nothing for it. Like and that. the last thing is the parties in the districts. It's easier. So the point is, it's easier to take over a party. So if you're a if you're a Tea Partier, it's easier to take over the Republican Party in Nevada than it is to try and start your own party. Yeah. Because at the because all you have to do is get the right candidate, run them in a primary, and you're you, and then you're in, stay. and then you got the machinery of the party yeah. there. So I don't see I see prospects for third party candidates at yeah. presidential level, but building a th third party, given the American political system, is just too hard to do. I think. Two more questions, and we'll yeah. close. Uh, you mentioned the personal vote, which is fascinating. The idea that that representatives, especially representatives, I assume senators also, mm -hmm. but especially members of Congress in the 60s started to run as themselves rather than their, their parties represented. If you go back and read one of my favorite books of all time, which I, I haven't plugged enough on this program, which is Robert Caro's biography of Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson's political life is very tied into the party. Mm -hmm. It's a book I recommend because it's a stunning portrait yeah. of ambition, power, America of the 20th century, incredible book. Um, but that was a very different era. Uh, and so that's a nice portrait of that era. This era is very different, this post-60s era. What changed? Was it an innovation where well, because politicians figured something out, or is it technology? Because you're an economist, you always have to have some exogenous variable. Yeah, give me one. Or and so you could take maybe some. My, my view of the exogenous variables are twofold. One of them is polling, so that... If you thought about what a congressman, so you think, go back to the example of Lyndon Johnson, right? And he he had worked for the guy who ran the King Ranch, who was a congressman, and uh, he was his legislative assistant. And uh, in 38, the guy retired, died, actually, and I think he died. And Lyndon Johnson uh, is going to run for the Democratic primary, but they're worried about his as life. A con as a, con as a Congress. For Congress. Yeah, run for Congress. He stepped down as legislative assistant and run for Congress. And... Uh, they're worried about his wife. 
well, well his wife, maybe they want to pass her. And and his father told him. Why well, were they worried about his wife? They are worried about because she might want to run. Oh, the, they want to the, hold the, the, the Congress, ex-Congress. Yeah, sorry, that, I thought you yeah. meant Lady Bird. No, no, the Congressman's <laughs> wife, not, not Lady Bird, sorry. Okay. So, uh, he says his father gave him the best advice, just tell him you're going to run the primary. She doesn't want to run the primary against you. So he ran in the primary. He announced he'd run the primary. She said, I'm not running. And, and he wins the seat and holds it, right? And he was a Roosevelt Democrat. Roosevelt, big time. Uh, but So two things happened. So what, what kind of information would he have about his district? Roosevelt had won the electorate. Think of uh, Jim Farley calling around the local party leaders. By, uh, but polling, it began in the 40s and got the 1948 election wrong. But by 1956, my view was there's no, there's no Democratic congressman in 1956 or senator who did not know that Dwight Eisenhower was going to kick Adlai Stevenson's fanny in the election. Yeah. So suddenly you can't run as a Democrat anymore. <laughs> or as a Stevenson. Yeah. You're going to help you, Stevenson get his, his So the research on this is hard passed. to find. But uh, So what happened is people began dropping that Democrat. I know in Chicago's first district... Uh, which I'm familiar with, uh, lived there at the time, but Bar uh, not at, the, not, uh, at, at that time, but it, Barrett O'Hara was the car. He always used to run a sign, a little picture of the first district in Chicago, and have a sign, Barrett O'Hara, Democrat, Chicago. Chicago first. In 1956, it suddenly became Barrett O'Hara, Chicago, District 1. He ran a different campaign. He, he wanted to pick up some other. So that's first. He didn't thing. advertise polling. he was a Democrat because he knew yes. Adlai Stevenson was going to Too get much polling. Yeah, the polling gave them much more information about how to do and who was wavering. And the second thing was television because television, I forget now whether it's a hot or cold medium, but the idea is that with advertising, you can portray a person. Uh, the commercial, some of your, your uh, readers or listeners might know, is that one of Jimmy Carter walking across the, in the primary of 76, walking across the p peanut crop thing. In, in, in a 30 second shot, you can portray the guy as kind, farmer, salt of the American, earth. salt of the earth. And TV commercials, uh, which you could begin to run then. And some of the research shows that in districts where there are, t where TV commercials were, fr that is a district that's compact, where the TV coverage is, uh, is useful. So in New York, uh, if you put a commercial on New York television for Congress, uh, it's not so great because, first of all, <clears throat> the New York television covers 14 congressional districts. So you're getting one fourteenth of the listeners at the cost. But of in Peoria, yeah. Illinois, where the district, the Peoria TV channel covers ninety six percent of the district, so we we're able to measure some of these in that time. And it turns out that the more uh, efficient the district, For the more the purposes. higher the personal vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, the combination you could sell yourself yes. vis vividly, yes, independently of yeah. your label as Democrat yes. or Republican. Yeah, and you could uh, uh, so the, cool. the combination of those two exogenous variables. Uh, I think, drove this new electoral system. Which, by the way, is now changing because of the large number of independents. So my closing question yeah. is um, maybe a silly question. I asked you a year ago about a possible opposition to President Obama in a primary, and you said wisely at the time, I thought, uh, that that was a stupid question because there's no way the Democratic Party is going to run an opponent for their first, the first black president elected in the United States. Which I thought, yeah, good point. I'm wrong. It's silly. Less stupid today. It seems less stupid today. So I was <laughs> it is. Ask you. I don't think I said stupid. No, no, I, I felt stupid yeah. afterwards. Um, it, there's a lot of opposition to Obama on the left. Yep. Interestingly, the, the yep. right, of course, never liked him much. As you said in the yep. early days, Republicans liked him. Some it quickly faded. Yep. Uh, they like him a lot less now. Uh, the Democrats appear. Not to like him nearly as much, particularly the base. Yep. Um, Paul Krugman and other prominent pundits decry his lack of whatever it is yep. that day. Yep. What do you think? Well, I think it's more likely today. I still don't think the probability is at 50, because I think as the first African-American president, I think Democrats are going to have a hard time running against him. But uh, Bernie Sanders and some other people, uh, as well as Krugman and others, some people in Congress have begun to say, 
he should have some opposition in the primary, and the idea is to move him, move him to move the him. left, where which I think would not be a good place for him to be running for reducing his chances yeah. of reelection. For but the, uh, for but the, the odds, but the odds of uh, his generating somebody other than Ralph Nader are higher today, uh, considerably higher. So that when you asked me that question, I would. I was sort of an absolutely no, 1.01%. Yeah. But now it's non-trivial. I mean, it's like 0. 0.3. It's growing. Not, it's not and, going down. And I think the, you know, we had that conversation in August of 2010, yeah. which was at the end, almost the end of a very disappointing summer of recovery, as it yeah. was labeled. But I think most of us figured, okay, the recovery's been disappointing, but it'll start to pick up steam. Yeah. A year's gone by. It hasn't yeah. picked up steam. Right. In fact, it looks like it's slowing. Yep. Unemployment's been incredibly uh, stubborn yep. and coming down. Yep. And if it gets worse between now and February, I think he's in big trouble. I, I, well, yeah, he's, I mean, he's in trouble. He could be beaten if the Republicans have anybody, right, that's reasonable. I think he could be beaten. Uh And and uh, the one key thing to watch, the more likely he is to get a Democratic opponent, the more likely he is to be beaten. And if you think about the, probably the most analogous situation is 1992, right, where if you'd asked me in like 90 after the Iraq War, et cetera, even after he passed the tax increase, back, back, back on that, he still was pretty popular. Uh, and it was only when the economy started to slide that he lost that popularity. But you, it, but when he got uh, Pat Buchanan against him, and he did very well against him in New Hampshire, it was then you knew that they were in some trouble. So if Obama even gets a reputable opponent, in that's a bad primary, sign. Yeah. That's a bad sign for him. Yeah. yeah, and it's much higher now. You were. It was a good question. <laughs> uh, well, I hope I didn't say. I'm pretty sure I didn't. No, say I'm sure you didn't say that. Uh, Well, we'll see what happens. My guest today has been Dave Brady. Dave, thanks for being part of it. Oh, thanks. It was great. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.